Hello, this is Mr. Mormon. Welcome to lesson number four in our first unit, The Nature of Science. Today we're going to be continuing our discussion of the scientific method, and we're going to move on to data and conclusion. Usually in science, when we're doing experiments, we will be collecting data that would first go into a data table. All the data is carefully measured and recorded in a data table. From there, uh, the data is often turned into a graph so we can more easily analyze the data and figure out what it's showing us. Today we're going to concentrate on, on making graphs, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with a discussion of the, the conclusion of what kind of things we should discuss today. So let's start now with the seven steps that I would advise using in constructing a good line graph. Make sure these seven steps are written in your notes. First, you label the x-axis. In your data table, the first factor listed, the first column um, in the data table, is going to be your manipulated or independent variable. This is the factor that was tested in the experiment. This gets labeled on the horizontal or x-axis. The next column in the data table is going to be the responding or dependent variable, things that you measured in the experiment. And sometimes there could be a couple of columns of that, uh, depending on the kind of experiment. This is going to be labeled on the vertical or y-axis. You're then going to label the units of measurement. On each axis, write the unit of measurement that was used. This is often placed in a parentheses. You're then going to number each axis. The data collected must fit along each axis of the graph. The axis must be numbered with the same interval. It has to be a consistent, even interval, such as going by twos, two, four, six, etc., or maybe going by fives, five, ten, fifteen. Most often you'll start with zero, uh, but there are some exceptions to that. Sometimes you may start uh, either use a compression bar or start at a higher number than zero. But again, it has to be an even, consistent scale. The same interval needs to be uh, uh, continued across the entire axis. You do not have to have the same interval on each axis. You are then going to plot the data. You just accurately place a point for each set of data. Sometimes you may be asked to use an X instead of a point or some other symbol. Just read the directions carefully. Um, I'm going to show you how to do this in the examples. Next, you're going to draw a best fit line for the data plotted or connect the data points. If this is what your data points look like when you make your graph, um, you could depends on the on the data. It may be more more appropriate to just connect the points, but usually we're going to do a best fit, which is where you make either a smooth curve or a straight line, whichever um, better matches the data, and go kind of right through the points. Where would that line go? So that uh, some of the points are below, some of the points are above that with a straight best fit. And finally, you're going to title the graph. Write a title for the graph based on the type of data collected. Uh, often you could just write it as you know, one variable versus the other, the independent variable versus the dependent variable. Uh, otherwise, just figure out a way that you can get uh, you know, the information into the title about what the graph is about. OK, next I'd like to give you some graphing tips. Number one. Always use a pencil when graphing. Graphing can be difficult, and making mistakes is common. If you're working with a pencil, you can easily fix those mistakes. You don't necessarily have to start all over. Number two, remember this phrase so you will always know which variable goes on which act, and that's dry mix. Now, what that stands for. Here's, here's just a, a start of a graph. We got the X and Y labels uh, on there. Uh, dry mix can remind you that the manipulated or uh, independent variable is going to go down here on the X. That's the mix part. Don't forget your units. 
um, the DRY, dry, can, remember, can remind us that the dependent or responding variable is going to go over here on the Y axis. Again, don't forget your units, and we are going to put those in parentheses. So dry mix can remind us that the dependent or responding variable is on the Y axis. The manipulated or independent variable is on the X axis. Third, the X and Y scales must be consistent or even. You don't have to have the same scale on each axis, but if you start going by twos on the x-axis, you have to continue going by twos. Sometimes students start plotting their data, they're going by twos, and they realize, oh, they're running out of room, so they change the scale. You cannot do that. You have to have a consistent, even scale all the way across. Same thing on the y-axis, a good, consistent scale. Um, also, a lot of times on the test, the data that they give you is not given in consistent intervals for the um, uh, independent variable. They give you kind of like, like weird oddball numbers. Uh, and a lot of times students start plotting those as their numbers along the scale. Don't do that. You make an even consistent scale, usually starting with zero, and then number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 5, 10, 15, 20, etc. Even consistent scales. Four, you don't always have to start with zero. Okay, look at the data. Usually you will be starting with zero, but sometimes if the data, you know, are very high numbers, you're going to start with a higher number. Um, if you want to use compression bars like you learned in math, that's fine to show that the, the you know, you can write zero um, and then use the compression bar to show where you're going to start uh, labeling the scale. Five, you're going to mark the lines you number, like 0, 5, 10, etc. You do not have to mark and number every single line. Very often you're just going to, uh, you know, you can figure out a way that you can show your even consistent scale without numbering every single line. Okay, next we're going to look at some examples. Here's one from the 2014 state assessment uh, for eighth grade science students in New York. It's, um, it's question 48 through 50. It says, base your answers on the information below and on your knowledge of science. Um, I'm, it, the question covers a couple pages, so I'm going to show you one part at a time so that we can read it carefully. A group of students conducted an experiment to test the hypothesis that radish plants watered with acidic rainwater would not be as tall as radish plants watered with non-acidic rainwater. The students planted two identical radish seeds in equal amounts of soil. One was watered with non-acidic rainwater and the other was watered with an equal amount of acidic rainwater. All other variables that would affect plant growth were the same for both plants. The students measured the heights of the plants in centimeters. The height of the plant watered with acidic rainwater on various days is shown in the table below. All right, and they give you some data. Now I'm going to shrink that down so we can move on to the next part, but I'll leave it there so we can access it if we need to. So here's the next part. It says the height of the plant watered with non-acidic rainwater is shown by the dashed line on the graph below. On the graph, use an X to plot the height of the plant watered with acidic rainwater for each day shown on the data table. Connect the Xs with a solid line. Okay, so I've adjusted it so we can see both the data table and the graph that we need to fill in. Now, the test was nice and filled in the axes for us. They already made the scales, they labeled everything, um, the units are there, all we have to do is plot the data and they want us to use an X. All right, so how do we do that? Well, the first data set that I see is on day eight, the height of the plant with the acidic water was one. So I find day eight, that's down here on the bottom. I move up that line until I get to a height of one centimeter and I make my X. I then find day 12, which is the next data point in my data table, and I have to go up to two, and I plot that X. Day 14, it's up to three. 
say 17, it's up to 4. Now, I don't have 17 on the bottom here. So I have to go right between the 16 and the 18 and make my x there. On day 20, it's up to 7. So I've got my x. It then asks me to connect them with a solid line. So I'm just going to make a nice line connecting all my x's. Done with question 48. Okay, I'm going to leave the graph there, but I brought up question 49 and 50 so we can finish this up. Describe how the data support the student's original hypotheses. Here is the, uh, the paragraph that they gave us in the beginning. And we can see the hypotheses right here that radish, their hypothesis was radish plants watered with acidic rainwater would not be as tall as radish plants watered with non-acidic. Now, looking back here on our graph, we can see we plotted uh, the acidic rainwater, and sure enough, it's not as tall. So their hypothesis seems to be supported by the data. We can see the acidic rainwater. I'm going to label it here. Uh, that that line is below, so we can write our answer. The data for plants grown in acidic rainwater is lower. That line is below the non-acidic rainwater. The next question asks us to describe one way in which the students might improve the design of this experiment if it were repeated. A good way to answer this type of question is to always think of how could I collect more data. They could repeat the experiment with more radish plants. If, if you remember in the original paragraph, they said they only used two plants, one in non-acidic and one in acidic. Uh, it would be better if they could do it with more plants. Now, that's not the only way that they could collect more data. They could do it for longer periods of time. Um, there are other ways that this could be uh, improved, but this is probably the, the most obvious answer. They could repeat the experiment, and they could do it uh, with more plants and collect more data. Okay, our next example is going to be a little bit more advanced and comes from a Regents exam, a Living Environments Regents exam. This question comes from the uh, this question comes from the June 2013 Regents. Uh, it covers two pages, so we'll look at it in sections. Uh, directions 44 to 55. Let's just explain the directions for Part B. Uh, but for 44 through 47, you're going to base your answers on the data table below and on your knowledge of biology. The data table shows the number of breeding pairs of bald eagles in New York State from 1991 to 2003. I'll just cut and paste that up in the corner so we can see it as I put the next page up. So here's the next page, and I th think I can just put the data table right here to the side. That, sh that should work just fine. So the first thing we did need to do is mark an appropriate scale without any breaks on each labeled axis. So you look at your data table, figure out how you're going to put it. Now they get you started. They already have the axes labeled for you. Year will be on the x-axis, number of breeding pairs on the y-axis. You just have to figure out a good consistent scale. So I look at the years. I see it starts with 1991 and goes up to 2003. 